to welcome you all here to the University of North Carolina at Asheville. This is a very celebratory time for those of us at the Black Mountain College Museum and Arts Center because of our new collaboration with this university. It's going to mean so much to all of us. And we want to thank this university profusely for everything they've done for this conference. Um, I think it's clear to any of you who attended any of the sessions today what a fine faculty there is here and how many correlations there are between the things that go on at the East University and some of the things that happened at Black Mountain. Um, I have two very brief announcements. First of all, we have a very limited number of posters for this event that are available upstairs. Uh, we have some that are signed by the artist, Orthea Rockburn, and we have some that are unsigned. They're a little less expensive, uh, but none of them are terribly expensive. Also, the clay workshop uh, is happening tomorrow in the grotto, which is the room right over here. So um, if you plan to go to that clay workshop, it will not be in the Owen building. It will be here. I would like now to introduce Mrs. Fernandez, this woman is the provost of the University of North Carolina at Asheville and has been very instrumental in this event this evening and we're very, very grateful to her. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening and welcome everyone um, to UNC Asheville campus and the highlight of this wonderful conference. One of the true joys of my position here is the opportunity to participate in events like this, welcoming people to our campus, and sometimes to meet and introduce phenomenal individuals such as tonight's keynote speaker. An old proverb teaches us that all art is ephemeral, and so it is, just as everything in worldly life including us in our present forms, the clothes we're wearing, even this building we're gathered in, will eventually fade away. All things must pass, sang George Harrison. But real art is timeless within the eternal moment in which we experience it. Real art arises out of the creative stillness and points us to the lasting truth of who we really are. So art is ephemeral, yes, and it is eternal. The same is true of Black Mountain College itself, a magnificent creative work whose life of less than three decades was ephemeral and yet lasting. Black Mountain College lives on in the form of the legacy and continuing influence of its fabulous cadre of artists and writers whom we are learning more about in this conference. It lives on in the form of the Black Mountain College Museum, and I like to think in the form of UNC Asheville. Lately, I have been reading the recent achievements of our world-class faculty, and in reading each report, I am struck again and again by how art, in all its forms, is central to the work of our professors and to the outstanding liberal arts education we provide. Surely UNCA is a reincarnation of Black Mountain College, or at least it bears some of its DNA. Black Mountain College alumni comprise an impressive array of influential artists and writers. It is our privilege and delight tonight to have one of them with us. I must confess, though, that I was shamefully late in becoming aware of Dorothea Rockburn and the prominence of her work. It was just last June that I read in the New York Times of a, quote, thin elfin woman in an oversized blue sneakers, some 40 feet up, inspecting the tippy top of a huge canvas hanging on the southern wall of the Queen's Museum of Art. This was Dorothea Rockburn working with her team of artists on a gigantic mural, 41 feet high and 16 wide, that shows the constellations on the night Colin Powell was born. I believe that her homage to Colin Powell is now at home in the U.S. Embassy of Jamaica, for which it was commissioned. 
New Yorkers got to see the work in progress in Queens simply because its museum is blessed with the 42-foot wall. <laughs> Painting the work all together as a whole was important to Miss Rockburn because she said, quote, you get to make different decisions when it's all one piece. You get to nurse it along. If you do it in pieces, then it's just color by numbers. Yet numbers are important to her art, for at Black Mountain, she studied with her beloved mathematics professor, Max Dane, a colleague and friend of Einstein. Dane taught her that all nature is written in numbers. In 1960s, her art began to include ideas from topology and set theory. And in the 70s, her abstract geometric works of cut and folded paper won Miss Rockburn renowned in the art world. During a visit to the astronomy room of an 18th century Italian villa in 1991, she was captivated by a ceiling fresco that charted the orbits of the planets. The experience inspired her to peruse Galileo's notebooks which revealed the true meaning of the Renaissance. As she describes it to the Washington Post, the Renaissance was not just a, quote, flair in art, but a body of knowledge of mathematics, philosophy, and astronomy the Greeks got from Egypt, digested, and delivered to Europe. After that epiphany, she began painting the night sky Dorothea Rockburn's influential works hang in the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Guggenheim Museum, to name a slight few. She has lectured at top universities and venues around the world and received prestigious awards too numerous to mention now. It is my sheer honor and pleasure to have her with us tonight. Please join me in showing our appreciation for Dorothea Rockburn. wanted to talk, first of all, about Black Mountain and how wonderful it is to have experienced this conference because, you know, Black Mountain was really small. Often people have said to me, why can't there be a Black Mountain today? And there can't be a Black Mountain today because there aren't any colleges that are that small. I mean, usually, during the years when I was there, there was maybe 20 students and 20 to 25 faculty. And that's how small it was as a rule. I mean, there was a slight flare after the Second World War and the GI Bill when there were more students, but for the most part, it was very, very tiny. Now, when you think the duration of the college and the very small student body the fact that we're all here together to explore what it did, I feel that um, it's a different kind of pragmatism. <laughs> you know, if, if somebody had, had set out to do this, to have something reverberate that much, and it, it's in Europe. When, usually when I do talk, af the questions afterward are rarely about my work. They're more about Black Mountain and what it was like to be at Black Mountain. So I think that is just a, a wonderful and amazing lesson about what is practical in life and what is not, and how that works out in the long run. Um, learning at Black Mountain was a revolutionary experience. I was never quite sure exactly how it was taking place. It often seemed as if by osmosis. There were no grades, attending classes was a choice, and yet Black Mountain was one of the most competitive atmospheres, atmospheres I've ever experienced, and I live in New York. <laughs> Everyone worked very hard, partly 
we were educated through cross-pollination. Since I'd started art school in Montreal at an early age, I was a pretty well-trained student, not an artist yet, but I could, I could handle a brush and paint. <clears throat> so when I arrived, I, I really knew how to paint, but I didn't know what to paint. And that's where Black Mountain came in. Most of the young painting students at that time, <clears throat> uh, that's 1950, were painting abstract expressionist work. You could always, you can almost tell who the last New York teacher was because that's what all the work looked like. And that's what students are supposed to be doing, actually. Uh, but that was not how, first of all, I come from Montreal and I come from a French English background and I felt more curious than that. And I wanted to explore the nature of nature, uh, how the universe ticks, how thought itself might be constructed visually. I wasn't looking uh, for a method of painting, but for an understanding of the construction of nature, as well as a deeper understanding of Western philosophy. Max Dane invited me to take his class, and I was completely horrified because I knew no math. I mean, I went to an English girls' school, and I knew how to write, but I certainly didn't learn math because they didn't think women needed math, as a matter of fact. Uh, but in that gentle way that many great thinkers have, he explained that uh, he would uh, teach me mathematics for artists. And uh, so we took these walks every morning early where he taught me math as we looked at nature. And I've been talking to uh, David, and he said Max is well known for his interest in, uh, in the way flowers were formed in botany and so on, but I didn't know that at that time. After a long time, I mean, he was explaining probability theory, Fibonacci progressions from the way the plants grew, things like that, you know, the, he'd show me how a daisy was formed mathematically. I mean, it was really, in probability, he would talk about how you could predict the root system of a tree by looking at a leaf system above the ground. Um, after, after a while, uh, I got courageous because he kept encouraging me, and I did take classes. And uh, actually, much to my amazement, I was able to follow. And there were some pretty heavy-duty people in that class, small, but. Uh, <clears throat> and then, also, there were a lot of other teachers that I just it was just incredible to be there. Um, Bill Levy, Albert William Levy, taught philosophy. He wrote, I think, a book that is still Philosophy 101 book. But I had, uh, I had learned more about French philosophy, actually, and I didn't, especially existentialism and so on. Uh, and I didn't know about people like John Dewey or Popper or the people that he taught me about, and it was aside as well as the classics, and it was a marvelous experience working with him. And then I studied dance, uh, first with Catherine Litz, and then with Merce Cunningham. Uh, I studied voice with Mrs. Yalowitz. Lou Harrison, a, a, a very well-known composer, wrote a part for me in one of his scores because Mrs. Yalowitz taught voice. Uh, which I performed. I, I can't really sing, I have to say, but it, everybody was very patient. I studied photography with Hazel Frieda Larson. My fellow photo photography students were Cy Twombly and Bob Rauschenberg, but remember, nobody knew those names then. <laughs> uh, Steichen, uh, Commodore Steichen would, uh, at Hazel's invitation, uh, was, he was living in Asheville, and he would come by every once in a while and crit our work. Very interesting. He asked me to bring work to the modern, and uh, he was very helpful. And I think he bought some work of Bob's at that time. I also studied uh, poetry, first with Olson, and then with Hilda Morley. And then there were things like Peter Jenner John's Sound Like Movement Workshop, where 
I think it was uh, uh, something to do with the Bauhaus and the Schlemmer dances. Very, very interesting project. Uh, <clears throat> but it's hard to talk about Black Mountain if you just don't, I don't want to just relate stories. But I, I want to somehow impart what was going on there. It was not paradise. There were conflicts. There were all kinds of things. And you really had to sort your, find your way through it all, which was, that was interesting too. My fellow students were brilliant, and many became well known. Of course, I also studied painting, which is why I came there, uh, with Jack Tvorkoff, Esteban Vincente, Philip Gustin, Franz Klein, Peter Jennerjohn, and uh, Joe Fiore. My education at Black Mountain is an embarrassment of riches. It was fantastic. Uh, I brought a, an 11 minute DVD of some of the process of doing the homage uh, to Colin Powell Commission. I'll tell you a little bit about that. There's an organization called FAPE that works with the government. And they, uh, it used to be that in the embassies throughout the world, there were kind of rotting Chinese carpets on the wall. And this organization, headed by some very uh, good people, uh, began to commission art in embassies. And uh, that's, how, that's how this came about. The, the work is not installed in Jamaica yet. We painted it in Queens. Sometime, now we're waiting for the wall to be prepared in Jamaica. Sometime in January, uh, the wall, work will be restretched on the wall in Jamaica. And then at that time, we'll put the gold leaf constellations on. We couldn't put them on before because it, it went on the restretching, the lines would be pulled out of alignment. OK. Perhaps the biggest quest of the artist it is to define an object and then make it. And of course, the object that we find to make is drawn from experience. And that experience is taken from everywhere and everything my experience becomes internalized, but I see it in a visual form which demands to be seen as an object. This is my art. The relationships I have put together here are only a small aspect of how I think. I am vitally interested in understanding the ways of nature and how nature forms itself. I'm interested in how artists through the centuries have abstracted forms from nature to make art, from Egypt through today. If you take a three-dimensional object, a three-dimensional object, a landscape or a figure, and depict it on a two-dimensional surface, the subject matter has been abstracted. I make no differentiation between abstract art landscape or figurative art. I consider all the arguments about abstract art as opposed to realistic subject matter to be a false argument. Are we ready to go? OK. <laughs> this is 11 minutes of what will be, a, I think, a half hour DVD eventually. When I was a kid, I was doing painting with my art class on a Saturday, and we were painting a landscape. When I was through with the assignment, I looked at nature and I looked at my painting, and I thought, nature is doing it better. Why?
Well, I was always interested in science and I know that when I was 13, I had a subscription to Scientific American, which was kind of early, you know. When I was 13, I walked around that year saying, science or art? <laughs> and art won. <laughs> When I was in New York, I took math books out from the library, and at night, I would do geometry. I was working on some pretty complex equations, and I loved doing it, just loved it. And I, I did it the way other people do jigsaw puzzles, except it seemed to inform me in, an, in some incredible, basic way. Somewhere around 1990, I was invited to go to the American Academy in Rome as artist in residence. Again, I just sort of hit the books. And I made some inquiries about how I could work there, and I asked what access they had to the Vatican Library because I knew that the papers of Galileo were there. I was able to get access to Galileo's papers, just incredible. And I realized that to practice ge geometry is to finally practice astronomy. And then I went to a villa, which I've never been able to find ever since. It was a mannerist villa, probably built around 1650, slightly after Galileo. And there was one room devoted to astronomy. There is a place for the telescope to go in the side of the wall. And on the ceiling was painted a painting with the various lines of the paths of the planets. When I saw that, I understood so much. It was very riveting. One of the things that I became very conscious of when I was watching that ceiling, looking at that ceiling, was that the artist was not just painting the path of the stars, but he was painting energy centers and, and clearly knew mathematics. And I I mean, I can't tell you what overcame me at that very moment. After I saw that ceiling, I started to make some drawings. And when I came back to New York, my work completely changed. I was studying energy centers in the universe. I was studying astronomy night and day, reading books, watching uh, films on the internet. Uh, doing everything I could do to know about astronomy. And that made me think about doing wall paintings again. I had met Colin Powell on several occasions, had dinner with him and his family, and admired him. Fape approached me a few years ago and asked me if I would do a wall honoring Colin Powell in Kingston, Jamaica, where his family is from. The work will be called Homage to Colin Powell. And it is the nighttime sky on the night that he was born in the Bronx. But it's the nighttime sky over Jamaica on April the 5th, 1937. Well, I knew the idea right away. As soon as I, as soon as I was asked to do it, I knew what it would be. I developed sky charts to study and and, I'll, and I'll, I was also doing a lot of reading at the time about it. And I mean, how do you paint a sun, you know? That's tricky. <laughs> there are a lot of little do dots which represent the stars here. And as you know, the gold leaf will, these lines will all be in gold leaf. And this will be 
black and ultramarine blue and various uh, silvered colors will be throughout here. Since Colin Powell's sign is Aries, I'm going to do the depiction of an Egyptian ram's head on his sign. The Egyptian ram's head will be painted here. The sign for Aries will run over it in gold leaf. Uh, this is the sun. So the sun will be depicted here. All of these little circles represent stars. And those stars put together uh, depict the various signs. I've always had an idea that art should be extraordinarily beautiful. Beautiful like the night is. For the first time, I'm actually painting the wall on canvas. Uh, I'm working with a crew in Queens on the painting. I'm not painting it by myself. There's a lot of considerations in terms of the emotional depth of the work and how to arrive at that, especially since I'm working with other people in other hands. I want nobody's hand to be visible in the work. But I will be there every minute, guiding their hands and hopefully their hearts. When the painting is finally finished, and we think it'll probably take six weeks or more to paint uh, with, of course, a lot of the real work goes in through the pre-planning. You know, I started with the black here and then I brought, did it very slowly. And then, you know, and this is really quite blue over the black, you know, and it disappears into the black. So this black has to come up a bit more, a little bit more. And then, yeah, the black at this point comes up even. Once it's finished, it will be rolled and shipped to Jamaica, and then it will be glued to the wall in Jamaica. Well, I'm very honored to be doing it, and I am extremely excited about it, to be able to work on this scale. You know, always within every work, there's a deep mystery. And I think that deep mystery is a universal truth. And if a work of art doesn't contain that universal truth, it isn't great. And not every work can, but one strives for it. And I think since this is such a wonderful subject matter, I think it can. I was born in Montreal. I was often sick as a child. In order to keep amused, I was drawn to my mother's books on Egypt. I began by looking at mummies to scare myself silly, but stayed to observe the beauty of proportions and light in Egyptian art. It became a part of me. Uh, my mother had the uh, the original Richard Burton uh, books of uh, Travels in Egypt, and these were engravings, but they were really good. Uh, 
Like most artists, I rebelled against my background and left Montreal as soon as I could at the age of 17. From 50 to 54, I attended Black Mountain College. Um, how did I know to go there? Good guidance from art teachers and dumb luck. I cannot begin to describe what Black Mountain did for me. For some reasons which I don't understand, I can grasp mathematical concepts. Max Dane, who was a topologist, as you know by now, and a friend of Einstein's taught me math. He showed me that all of nature is written in numbers. His teachings are throughout my work and led me to a better understanding of science, art, and just about everything. I came to New York in 54. By 58, I spent some part of every day at the Brooklyn Museum looking at the Egyptian collection, which was more complete than it is now. And at that time, it was better than the Met. Uh, primarily, I looked at the things from the New Kingdom, from Tel El Amana. Uh, previous to that, I had taken a job at the Met, uh, which led to cataloging Egyptian artifacts. As I haunted the Brooklyn Museum, I likened the photographs of Edward Muybridge, uh, his nudes in motion to the teams of Egyptian horses depicted in stone. The art climate in New York in the 60s was both exciting and daunting. There was great painting going on, but the sexism was rampant. Um, <clears throat> I felt, once again, as I had at Black Mountain, I, it, I felt invisible. It took me a long time to understand and act on the path ahead of me. Now, you know, I, I come from a, a French background at, in painting, and I uh, was always drawn to very plain things. And on, on the left um, is a painting of mine called Ivory Black, and on the right is a Chardin, and who, as a student, I was very taken with. And when I first began to work again in a non-representational way, I, um, or not, I hadn't been working representationally at Black Mountain, but I really decided to take, take a real step forward. I didn't want to work with art materials. I had uh, acquired too many bad habits, and um, I decided to work with industrial materials. Now, I wasn't unique in that. That was around at the time. And I bought some what was called wrinkle finish painting, paint at the hardware store that you heat treated, and I painted on aluminum, and that's what the next uh, couple of paintings are. I did a, a group like this. This a, a painting is uh, called Tropical Tan, and again, it's quite big, and it's very plain. It's the steel that it's on is called pig iron, and I was, I guess, really into those kinds of materials at that moment. Again, uh, the European side of me, Giordani was, was and is a favorite. And uh, after I had worked in metal, I found it that my mind was always way ahead of the work. So I started just to work in paper. One day, I noticed the wrinkle finish paint on the brown paper that was on the floor. And I thought, hmm, why bother, bother with metal panels? Now, at that time, I never, ever thought I could show my work. Women just weren't shown in New York unless you were, unless you sort of knew your way around certain social paths uh, in order to have that happen. And although, in a sense, I did know my way, but I'm not, I wasn't willing to do that. Uh, and so I, I began to work just in paper on uh, the uh, right side is just plain uh, butcher paper and the curve is a natural curve from the roll. And on the left hand side is a graphite on butcher paper. And I did a lot of these works. And then I started also to work in crude oil. Uh, I bought it across the street in the hardware store and I kind of made crude oil sandwiches. Now at this time, I was trying to sort out for myself, and even in the, in the early paperwork, just what com comprised a set. Because I was doing, uh, I was reading books on set theory at night, and trying to remember everything Max had said, and I was really trying to understand set theory. So 
in some way, which I can't understand now, I can't remember now, this represents a set. <laughs> and uh, this, then I did this work, was the, which was the, inter, it's called intersection because it was the intersection. I put together various works, the crude oil work, the set theory work on, uh, with cardboard and paper, and I, I work those elements, the way you work an equation. And I put them together that way. And then um, I got, I, I'd learned the gold mean, of course, in, in school. And I got really interested in, in it once more. And um, I think that was uh, around, um, around 1973. And uh, I began to look, I got every book I could on it. And I began to really look into it again. And I um, was also looking at the Greeks because I'd been taught in art school that the Greeks used golden mean and everything. And I was looking at Greek statuary at the Met. Um, and you can tell that statuary is all golden mean. Years later, 8081, when I went to Egypt, I got to the pyramids and I immediately saw that it was pi. And then when I went to Luxor, I realized that it was all golden mean and that the Greeks, in fact, had learned that geometry from Egypt. So after I fooled around with a lot of other things, I've tried to shorten this. <laughs> I began to do some small works based on the golden section, but also based on Italian painting. I was following the colors of Duccio, uh, and by, I started to hang out in Italy a lot uh, from about 1972 on. Every bit of time and every dime I had, I went to Florence. And I had a gallery I was showing there. And, uh, but what I was, the, one of my dealers there, there were two dealers, and one of them was a painter himself, and he just delighted in the fact that I was so interested, because all, at that time, American artists really were not interested in what was going on in Europe. They were trying to make it new from another point of view. Uh, people like Judd and so on, they weren't, Donald Judd, they weren't interested in what I was interested in. My way of thinking is to take the classics, the classic concepts, and radicalize it. I, did, I tried to do that at Black Mountain, and I've tried to do that my whole life in art. And I painted this painting, actually, so sepulchral, uh, when my father died. And I was in the middle of doing a show, and I thought, well, do I stop and mourn, or do I go on working? And I thought, my father would want me to go on working. He was a marvelous man. And I painted this painting. And then I started looking at Romanesque architecture, both in France and in Italy. And I wanted to do work that gave that kind of light. There, in Romanesque buildings, there's a light that is indescribable between light and dark that touches your emotions. And I wanted to try to work that way. This work is, again, brown paper. And it has a varnish on one side, copal varnish. And it's all one piece of paper. It's cut according, it's marked and measured according to the golden mean. Certain significant cuts have been made and folded. There's no, nothing about it is arbitrary. And yet, I can't say it's a system. I've never been interested in systems. There were quite a few works in this group, which are called uh, the Romanesque drawings. And then I uh, went back to my love of Giotto. And I, as I was doing the, uh, the Roman drawings, I thought, I'd like to see these works in, done in a clear substance, like vellum. And I was also, I was also studying um, 
The, the last curve ever invented was done by a woman in Bologna called Agnesi. And there's a curve called the curve of Agnesi. And while I knew that I could never invent a curve myself, uh, I thought, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make it as a, as the end goal, and see what comes out along the way. And I was also, I've always run the math parallel to art. So the parallel here was Giotto. And they're called the Arena drawings. And there's, again, there's a clear varnish on one side. Nothing is arbitrary. Nothing is, no shape is just placed on the other. They all come from folding and cutting from top, the topological principles that I had learned from Max. I'm sorry that the, the, the PowerPoint doesn't reproduce these very well. Then I moved back over to Egypt, <laughs> still with the golden mean. And um, I did a, a, a group of work called the Egyptian paintings. I knew from the time I was a child and I saw those books on Egypt that I would go to Egypt. And it was getting to be time to do that. And I'd also always wanted to do a group of work based on the bar reliefs that I had seen on, in that book as a child and the way the light struck them. So I got very busy and I made the Egyptian paintings and then I went to Egypt when they were done because I knew I'd never have the courage after I saw, really saw Egypt <laughs> to make it up. And these are um, painted linen the wall, the line is drawn on the wall and through the paintings, and the painting is applied with Velcro to the wall. It's an installation, in other words. And some of the Egyptian things, of course, are done in basalt. Then I while I was malingering with Giotto, I got very interested in angels, very interested in angels. And you know, Courbet said, because he didn't want to paint angels, he said, show me an angel and I'll paint it. And I thought, you know what? I'm gonna show you an angel. So he started painting angels. <laughs> and this, was, this is white paper, again, PowerPoint just doesn't work as well as slides. And I, I've always thought this, this crucifixion by Giotto is the angels are some of the most poignant emotional work in the whole history of painting. And this, again, this is paper, mine is paper. But this is watercolor on either side of vellum. So in this case, there's silver watercolor, real silver watercolor on one side, and matte black watercolor on the other side, and then it's folded and glued. And this is gold, of course, and black. And this is a work that I kept. It's one of my favorite works. Uh, it was very hard to make, and I called it Dark Angel Elephant because I felt it was like making an elephant. And of course, I was very involved in uh, the way that Frangelico painted, and there's an exquisiteness to his color sensitivity that I wanted to learn from, and so I worked very closely um, you know, I was very interested in this whole passage here of the hair on the red robe. And this, of course, is gold. And uh, there's, I was also um, listening a lot to Glenn Gould at that point. And um, I feel some relationship to Glenn Gould because he's Canadian and because he knew of my work. Uh, and at this point, I was listening a lot, and I like. I like the way he played. 
and he said that he'd like to do a work, he'd like to uh, do a piano piece three times. Uh, once he, he did it just to kind of learn it. The second time he did it was also to learn it, but in a different way. And the third time he did it was to experience the pure ecstasy that you can have from knowing something thoroughly and 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 playing music. And I decided to do that with this work. I uh, painted it three times, and I took it, first two times I took it off the stretchers and threw it away, and the third time uh, I, I painted it without looking at anything, and he was right. And that's why it's called ecstasy. And while I didn't do that again, yes? I'm sorry? Yes, yes. Uh, well, I, I never painted work three times. I learned something from doing it that way. Also, at this time, um, everything, this is 84, every, for a while now, everything that I had been reading on topology, I couldn't, and set theory, I could not find, at least in the popular press, any information whatsoever. And I didn't know how to continue that work beyond, or that thinking, beyond where I had. And I decided to go back to my uh, French roots, my Ecole de Beaux-Arts painting roots, and uh, the Renaissance, and to paint that way. But I wanted to take it one step further. I wanted, so I layered the canvases. These are two canvases. I wanted to do paintings that dealt with perspective, but not in the ordinary window on the world way. What I wanted to do was have a painting look at itself. And that's why there are two canvases on top of each other, and each one is thoroughly painted. All the way through, there's no, nothing is uh, just applied. And the two angels refer to uh, the uh, distance between Giotto's angels and uh, Masaccio's angels. And of course, when I was in the fourth grade, I got handed Pascal, uh, Les Pensées, and I've kind of read it on and off ever since. I sort of, it's never too far from me. And as I said, I, since I couldn't deal with topology, I was uh, very interested in mannerist painting, which is uh, why I'm looking at Pontormo in depth in, in books in Italy and uh, emulating in some way mannerist work. And the state of grace really was a statement on my life because it always seems like everything's falling apart, falling in, and at the last minute it, it resurrects itself and, and is sort of beautiful. But again, Pontormo and the Three Marys, which if you ever have a chance to see that painting, it's in Carmignano, it's in a church by itself, it's the only painting, and since it's, uh, it's just been there untouched, uncleaned, and it's completely beautiful. And uh, when I painted the two panels, I didn't paint one panel uh, in, I, I painted one panel, usually the back panel, and then the top panel I painted uh, without the back panel in evidence. And when I was painting this painting, I, uh, and, and when I paint, I get lost, as every artist does. And when I began to, when I painted this painting, I didn't exactly know what I was doing, but as I said, I was very involved in mannerism at the time. But this shadow, from this top panel is a real shadow, and this is a painted shadow. And when I did it, I didn't know why I was doing it or what I was doing it. So that was an interesting experience. Uh, again, back to topology. This is all, this is all folded paper, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know that, I didn't see this projected on the screen. You can see the, the paper lines. Uh, <clears throat> And I was uh, quite interested in uh, uh, the actual plan of Sengal, which is all golden mean. And there's a, uh, 
a place where the monks sang and uh, the, because the church is all golden mean, their voices then reverberated throughout all of the rooms in a specific uh, rhythmic system. And then I decided to take all the shapes I've been working with on a trip to Egypt. I actually couldn't erase from my mind the look of the light of Egypt. I mean, it was quite amazing. And I had taken, uh, I had bought some papyrus there and I dragged it around with me and by the time I got it home, it was really, and went to use it, it was really too beaten up to use. And I was disappointed, but I thought, well, maybe it's in New York somewhere. You can get everything in New York. And I went to the art store, and lo and behold, it was there. And these works are a gold leaf on, on um, papyrus and watercolor. And by the way, that, that work, The State of Grace, is also gold leaf. I was, began to use gold leaf a lot on canvas. So, so what's happening in Colin Powell is precedented, in other words. And this is the, the sky chart. Now, the, the thing that I don't talk about in the, in the little uh, DVD is that when I saw, when I was in uh, that uh, palazzo, and I saw that painting on the ceiling, I had done a lot of installation work uh, uh, with set theory in the 70s a lot. And I had kind of traveled all over the world doing it. And doing those installations was pretty brutal. And uh, I, it was brutal because you're always dealing with people who actually don't want you to take up their time and their money that way. <laughs> and uh, so I, uh, when I realized that I really wanted to investigate Renaissance painting, uh, I, I, you know, it was a great relief to not be doing installations. So as I stood in that, Palazzo, looking at that ceiling, I felt like there was, I had a devil on either shoulder. One devil was saying, oh yes, you can do it, you can do it. And the other one was saying, don't you dare. <laughs> but <laughs> it went out, so I started doing it. And this was, you know, some of these things were, this was an installation in the gallery, but I put it in out of a time sequence because, um, because of its, direct relation to the Nautilus shell. But this is the Sony, this large Sony work, which is on the Sony, in the Sony building, and it's, and it's uh, based on the Mandelbrot uh, equation for chaos. And um, it also uh, has to do with the energy center in the northern and southern sky, the electromagnetic field, tracing the electromagnetic field through chaos uh, equation. And, uh, <clears throat> I included this because you can see that doing installations is some form of hell. But this is the this is the the, the two works side by side. They're actually across from each other in the Sony Building, which, if you're in New York, is on uh, Madison between 55th and 56th, and these are on the second floor, which is called the Sky Lobby. And then I did I I, I was offered a space in Ann Arbor. Uh, Michigan in the media center to do a work and it's a space that everybody turned down uh, a lot of other artists were offered it and I sat and I just loved it because it's discontinuous and that that fit in with all the spatial ideas that I was trying to play with and it folded and did all kinds of things and so I did a work called Euclid's Comet there it's, it's really very big too this is another aspect of that. And this is the work I've been doing recently. Uh, in uh, 2006, I started working on, uh, with watercolor on a specially treated vellum, uh, uh, excuse me, mylar, which is for architects, called Duralar. And it's treated so that things will, ink and paint will stay attached to it. And, um, I was also, and still am, very interested in 
uh, prime partition numbers. And manifolds. And that, that of course, outcomes from Mac. And angular momentum is how everything moves, of course. And on, and on ship curves. And this is the work I'm doing right now. It's uh, <clears throat> 11 by 14, and I've been looking into the geometry, as best I can, the geometry of star, of stardust, what happens when the stars explode and what that pattern is. And of course, there's a side to this which is so incredible and so emotionally deep. I, d I don't even know how to talk about it. It's just amazing. And then here's, here's the, the maquette for that. And here, this was when we had the opening in the Queen's Museum, the cutting of the, the, cutting of the, the line and the cutting of the, 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 the Joe Carroll had a, had a cake made in the, with the maquette model. <laughs> I thought, well, that's that, you know. And to have it being revised this way, to have Alice and Connie <laughs> and uh, uh, Mary uh, re keep the flame alive and work so hard with no money, it's just, it's an amazing feat that you've done. I mean, I'm just so happy. And And to have this school do this conference, I mean, I can't tell you, it's so terrific. I never thought such a thing, I mean, I thought, you know, well, it ended and it ended and it was a great thing and it was over, but it's not over. And isn't that wonderful? So thank you, school. <laughs> Can I answer any questions, I'm afraid? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> yes. Have you ever wanted to I'm sorry? Have you ever taught? Yes. I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I said to Connie earlier, this is the first school I've ever just about that I've ever been to where I didn't feel sort of nauseous. <laughs> Which is true because schools, you know, they are not open to learning. They're open to putting you in your little pocket, especially as a teacher, and keeping you there. And so, you know, I, I, lo I actually love to teach, but I don't want to, number one, run a school, and I don't want that I don't want that uh, limitation to be put on my thinking or my actions that schools can do. But what I have done is, you know, two weeks here and there where I just go in and teach and leave. And that I love. And I also started a, uh, a long time ago a kind of renaissance program in my studio where I take two or three young artists and I ask that they stay three years. And I teach them what I know. And I also help them to uh, get into the art world. You know, whatever access I have, I open it to them. And, and some of the graduates are, my graduates are more well known than I am. Uh, Carla Dunham, Mel Kendrick, uh, there's a bunch of them. <laughs> and and it's, a very, it's a great joy to me. It doesn't always work out. I mean, sometimes, you know, you, you don't hit it on every time. But uh, mostly I've just had marvelous people working for me. I do right now. And I know that they're going to go into the world and make great art. And so that's the way I like to teach. Yes? I'm sorry? I would like to be your next student. <laughs> it's arduous. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, you've been an abstractionist for a very long time. What does it feel like to have your work go in and out of favor over a very long period of time? You know, I, when I was
was a kid in Montreal, my brother was a champion skier. And he, this is a long way around, and he ac actually trained the Canadian Olympic ski team, so it was really good. Well, he trained me to ski, and I jumped, and I raced. And he said something to me which has, I followed. He said, uh, when you're uh, skiing, he said, don't look to the left or to the right to see who's beside you or who's behind you. Just go straight ahead. And that's what I do. I don't care about all that stuff. You know, I don't really, you know, I can't, I can't go with the fashion of art. I mean, that's not rewarding. Yes? Um, how do you feel, or do you have any relationship with um, the spiritual side of geometry, for instance, like the practices of the Pythagoreans and, and those things? Does that play into your work? You're talking about emotional. Well, that's why I do it. <laughs> it is, it, it, it's very uh, emotionally rewarding. And yes, I went to Taranto, where Pythagoras' uh, temple was, to walk those grounds. It's uh, in the south of Italy, near Bari. And I've, uh, you know, I, I'm in touch with people who are sc uh, Pythagoras scholars and, and so on. And I, and I, you know, I'm very interested in what he did, but. He, again, studied in Egypt. And I would love to know what the Egyptians really did, because it was, uh, I was talking to David about it, and it was an oral tradition, and we don't have, you know, results. We don't have uh, any written things that we know of. But yes, Pythagoras. <laughs> yes. You know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to hear sound balances. You're curious to learn how what um, dance and movement dance tie into your your work. Uh, well, you know, every musician, every mathematician is interested in music. That's just, you know, there's the whole Platonic harmony of the spheres, and now astronomers believe that they're beginning to hear the sounds that the spheres make, and you know, there's a lot of stuff about that. Uh, but in terms of dance, in my family, you came out of the womb taking courses. <laughs> so I, you know, went into ballet when I was four, and it was then called toe dancing. And, uh, you know, I just always took classes. So when I went to Black Mountain, it was just natural for me to check in with the dance teacher. And, uh, and they were thrilled because, uh, because I was trained. And then I came to New York, even though my life was very arduous, I still had a lot of leftover energy that I didn't quite know what to do with. So I uh, signed up for ballet classes uh, at ABT. You could, you could uh, take them for $10 a class then with Balanchine, can you believe it? And uh, not that I was good, I'm not saying that. I, you could just pay for them and do it. And I did that for a while and then, um, Ballet is actually boring because you don't really use your mind. And somehow or other, I wandered down to Judson Dance Theater, for any of you that know that history. And I began to work with the Judson Dance Theater. And I did, I did performances. I never thought of myself as a dancer, only as a painter. But at Judson, you know, after a while, all the painters were working there too, and they were all inventing, and Bob Morris, Rauschenberg, many, many artists, but, but I never, they choreographed. I never wanted to make a dance. I wanted to work in other people's dances, which is what I did, and it was, it was great. It was a great experience. And you know, there's, I don't think, I, I've noticed that there, nothing is isolated. I grew up with very, very good food. It was, it was just, you know, it was French. 
They talked about what they'd eaten. They talked about what they were going to buy. They talked about what they were going to eat. It was all about food. And it was, and it was good, you know. It was like really interesting, but very sexy and very sensuous. And when I went to Ecole de Beaux-Arts, it was simple to translate the warmth of that eating experience and the and the fun around the table you know it, it was it was uh, warm and great and so that that became a translation into how you paint a sensuous you know tactile kind of thing so it's all grist for the mill as far as i can tell Any more questions? Oh, okay. You were talking about how ancient teachings, like Egyptian teachings, were oral. And I know that, like, in other cultures, like, like Germany, they have their mysticism and practice is more oral. Like, is that the case here? Because I know that in some cultures, they have their own ritual that they do to communicate with the gods. And I wonder if, as an artist, using paint as a means of communication, instead of language, do you feel that language changes our perception of things? Or does it, does it kind of make that knowledge less meaningful by placing that judgment upon it of like naming this as an idea. You know? That's a great question. Um, the strange thing that I experience personally is that when I am working, I'm alone and I'm certainly not talking. And you do work from an inner place. And I think Plato, it was Plato who said, all knowledge is a matter of remembering. And I think when I work, it's a matter of finding this memory, this ancient memory. So it doesn't uh, gear to art criticism. And I don't like to read art criticism. Uh, you know, the Barney Newman quote, uh, art history is to art as ornithology is to birds. <laughs> However, you know, there's a place for all that too, and there have been good art critics and, and so on. Um, and I don't, you know, I think that my art, anyway, I can only speak for myself, is, uh, Nonverbal, and yet it's about ideas. You know, ideas, I think, it's not that conceptual art was a new idea. Art has always been conceptual. You cannot look at Michelangelo and say that is not conceptual. You know, it's always been conceptual. That's just like a kind of a, a hand, an art critic's handle on a phrase, you know, that is used to mark it. And so it's, I think I maybe make that differentiation when information coming from a critic is real or when it's part of a marketing device, which it can be very quickly. Somebody can be good one day and the next day they can be in the swing of their own career, making themselves look good and brilliant and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, I understand I understand what makes people tick. It's just that I find it boring to read. And I'd rather do math and read books on Egypt and astronomy and, you know, exciting information things. I subscribe to all the art magazines, but I don't read them. <laughs> and I don't say that in any kind of snobby way, you know, because other people read them cover to cover and they get that out of the, it's, I, I'm dyslexic, and although I've always read, I mean, my sister taught me to read when I was three, and the way children can teach children things, but I'm a slow reader, so I don't read newspapers because it's too arduous for me, and I don't read art criticism because, it, frankly, I fall asleep. I mean, I literally fall asleep, whereas with astronomy, no. Math, no. I mean, I may be reading a math book and fall asleep at night and then 
wake up and read it first thing in the morning. I mean, I really, you know, it enlivens me and gives me a sense of my own humanness and my own, it reflects the energy of the universe, but it reflects that to me and my own energy reflects back. I don't know if that makes any sense, but try, I'm trying to verbalize experience. No, never easy. Mm -hmm. Shall we say good night? <laughs> thank, thank you.